Hey, everybody, this is Think Global, and we like to say on Think Global that the world is our home, where strangers become friends and friends, become family, and so it's a, it's a big deal to us. Here we are, John. It is November. Yeah, I love it. Unbelievable. Here we are. Wow. I lied. I don't really love it. It's getting cold, and I'm not ready for it. I know. Uh, man, I was, I was in Southeast Asia just last week. Mm-hmm where it was in the upper 80s, balmy and humid. And uh, back here, we had snow on the ground. Yeah. That's kind of crazy. As we record this, the tips of my fingers are numb. Yeah, you're right. <laughs> this studio <laughs> podcast room is kind of chilly, but uh, that's okay. Outside, it was a brisk morning, a, a brisk 32 degrees. Um, anyway, so yes, it's November. And with November starting right around the corner... We're in this country going to celebrate Thanksgiving and then yep. quickly get to Christmas. Yeah. And our friends, our brothers and sisters in Canada just had their Thanksgiving yes. recently. And yes. that's exciting. And um, one of our colleagues up there, they he adopted a dish from American Thanksgiving, the uh, the sweet potato casserole with yes, the marshmallows yes. on oh, top. Yeah, yeah. So he was telling me about that yeah. just the other day. So oh, yeah. anyway, um, yes, Thanksgiving is right around the corner which brings Christmas right behind that. And in this season of celebration, we thought that would be kind of a fun thing to talk about on the podcast. Specifically today, how does sitting around a table, how does food unite humans together? That's right. Despite cultural differences, despite even political or ideology differences, religious differences, sitting around a table, there's something special about it. And I would include political differences. I said that. You did? All right, man. I missed it. I'm sorry. That's okay. Yes, but it does. It does bridge divides. Yes. Who does? All yeah. right, man. So I love it. So we we thought, you know, looking around the world, like let's look at what you know. We celebrate Thanksgiving. We just talked about how Canada has their Thanksgiving before ours, and how do other cultures celebrate different holidays, and where does food fit into that? And we did a, a little bit of research, and I'm just going to rattle off yeah. some countries and not a lot of details in them, but. Germany, Switzerland, Austria, they have a, a thing called the Harvest of Thanks. Okay, yeah. very similar to Thanksgiving. That's great. The Netherlands, they have a version of Thanksgiving. Granada, Israel. Um, I could go on and Vietnam. on and on. Yeah. The UK, China. You lived in China. Tell us about their celebration this time of the year. Well, they just recently celebrated their August Moon Festival where yes. they give moon, moon cakes to everybody. Yes. And that's a big, big celebration. So... Um, that's you know, everything in China is centuries old. So this right. one is a thousand year old festival, tradition, you know, yeah. tradition. Yeah. So yeah. you have that one, and then upcoming they'll have uh, the Chinese New Year, the Lunar New Year, yep. and that's a massive celebration. Lots exactly. of food and celebration, and Thanksgiving, and all yeah. that. So you know, India. But really, what struck me was actually, could we find a country in the world? that doesn't celebrate around a table in oh, some way. And what do we find? There's not one. Oh. I, I mean, we didn't do the research. Right. But somebody do the research. Find me any country in the world that doesn't have some form of holiday that is central around a table or food. Right, right. All of them do. We just have a few examples here. Right. But the point is, this is so central to the human condition that every culture or country in the world has some sort of holiday revolving around food. Yeah. And at those holidays, at those times of celebration, it's food that brings people into the same room. Yeah. So anyway, I find that this is a very interesting topic to me because, you know, we're going to, I want to dive a little deeper in a minute, but really what I've been asking myself the question of is why? Yeah. Like tons of research on, yeah, it's, it's food. We'll go into some of the research in just a second. And then I'm going to get into why is that the case? And I have a theory. All right. I can't wait to hear your theory, John. This is exciting. <laughs> Do you like but that for a teaser? Back to your challenge. I'd love yes. to see if somebody could find a, yeah. a country or a culture that doesn't do that. That would be interesting. Right. And then I would love to know why. Like, why, why not? they don't. Yeah. Yeah, but anyway. Okay, yeah. yes. Yeah. Somebody out there, some listener out yeah. there, do the research. Yeah. Come back got, to us. If you find one, we'd love to hear it. If you've got time on your hands, do that. We all have time on our hands. All right. All um, right. So I love some of this research around... Um, Dining habits and sitting up. I, I did find some of this interesting. So, um, 
Over 90% of parents say that their family is less stressed when they eat meals together. And I would agree. Yeah, you you raised four boys. Yeah, four what was that boys. Like? They love eating, of course. <laughs> and you know, uh, Lynn would often say, "We need a, a you know a farm out back and a cow on the porch to keep them fed." But one of the principles that um, we had in our home was we do dinners, mm. and you know we go our different ways. Sometimes before breakfast, people are in school or at work. Uh, therefore, lunches were out, but dinners were in a sense sacred. Um, it was a time for the family to sit down and eat and be with each other. And often what we found, some of the greatest conversation when when our our sons would talk and share what happened was right at the dinner table, mm. which was really awesome. Yeah. That was community. It was it was a connection. It was time with each other. So yeah. yes. Yeah. So, and, and I see that often. You know, I was with a family not long ago. I was visiting Nashville. Some friends had me over at their house for dinner. They have four kids and some of you having four kids. And I'm just a guest at their table, but we ran, went around the room and they, they had a kind of a little family inside saying, I forget what it was, but the basic idea was each person, kids, mom, dad, they even made me do it. Everybody shares the high and the low from the day. Yeah. And the kids have been at school and the mom and dad have been at work and I was just there, but uh, everybody shares a high and a low, you know? So it's, it's not just eating, but being around the table is conducive to True conversation. That's right. That's right. It, there's something relaxing, meaningful. Uh, you know, sure, there can be some uncomfortable moments, but most of it is meaningful and right. relaxing. Right. Yeah. I love. I love the uh, the also the statistic that came from that research and that 84 percent of the people who were surveyed wish they could share a meal with people more often. Wow. Yeah. It kind of makes me sad. It's, yeah. It speaks to it. Yeah, it does. <laughs> it speaks to the loneliness epidemic, which that's a different podcast. Right, right, right. <laughs> no, that's exactly right. People do long to share a meal with people. Yeah. And and that's a natural longing. It's it's mm. who we are. It's how we're made to be. Mm. Anyway, yeah. anything else there, John, on the research? Yeah. Well, there's another research that uh, the University of Oxford did. And um, really, when I read this, let, let's start with a caveat here. I'm in a little bit of like a snippy mood. Today? today, yeah, well, not like snippy bad. I'm just in a little bit of a uh, sarcastic mood. Yeah, well, we'll so, talk about that later. So my thing about this research, when I read this, I was like, who got paid to do this research? Okay, because here's what they found: the results in the research suggest that communal eating increases social bonding and feelings of well-being, and enhances one sense of connectedness. Sorry, con- contentedness. It enhances one sense of contentedness. And embedding within the community. Right. I'm no Oxford scholar, but I don't really need the research to know that. Right. That's right. <laughs> you know, that's my point. Who got paid to do this research? This is basic human. Someone got paid to do it and they affirmed what we already knew. Exactly. You're right. Okay. I can be snarky about that. Snarky. One as well. That's the word. Yeah. I'm a little snarky today. Yeah. But, you know, I like what also from Oxford. I mean, again, we didn't need Oxford to tell us this. Yeah. By the way, Kudos to Oxford. Um, but anyway, uh, they said uh, that people who eat with others are more likely to feel happy and satisfied with their lives. I have a snarky response to that, too. Yeah. But anyway, <laughs> let's just be honest. It's true. It's true. We knew it was true before that research was done. Right. Anyway. It's so central. The point is, in seriousness, it's so central to who we are. Everybody listening to this podcast has experienced what this is talking about, being around a table with people and you feel that common bond, you feel that sense of contentedness, you feel that sense of being embedded within the community, however big or however small, it brings you together. Right. All right. So, you know, why is that? I think one answer is, like I would say the biggest answer is that food is the sustenance of life. Yeah. We have to do it. Yeah. You have to eat. Yeah. And, And eating is delightful when done with others. Right. So that's why uh, one of the uh, statements that is as old as the Bible uh, (laughs) refers to the fact that we break bread together. Right. And breaking bread together is about the consumption of nourishment, but it's a nourishment also of the soul because we're with people. Right. It's a big deal. Yeah. So that leads us to, when I was reading a lot of this or thinking about this podcast, going that one step deeper of like, okay, these are very obvious statements. But why is it that food has that central, it's central 
to the human experience. Right. And being around a table with with people brings community together. That's global. Right. And but why is that? And you just alluded to it because it's a part of the sustenance of life. So I kind of jotted down a couple of notes here. So on that thing about sustaining life, food literally sustains life. Yes. So if you hang with me here, if you hanging. if you feed someone at the bare minimum, aren't you acknowledging their dignity as a human and you're helping in their survival? Yes. So I think that's a good point, John. If, if you go all the way back to the caves of the origins of human history and you fed someone that came from a cave across the way, you were saying, I want to help keep you alive. Right. So you are acknowledging their dignity just as a human and helping keep them alive. Now, fast forward however many, many, many years to here we are today. That's right. We're around a table. At the bare minimum, we're acknowledging across cultural divides, political divides, religious divides, ideology divides, whatever it is, we're acknowledging your life is worth sustaining right. when I feed you. Yes. Uh, let me add to that. This just pops in. I, I think that's brilliant, John. But let me Thank add you. to that. There's no research behind in, that. It's just my little brain. But in creation, where did God put man and woman? In a garden. Exactly. Is that not cool? Very cool. All right, I love that. Yes. Um, and I love the point here that uh, we have in our notes, and that is the the idea of food and nourishment, that basic need that we have has a way of forging relationships. Mm. We can bury our anger towards each other over a meal, and it provokes laughter. Right. The very things that we need for our soul and for life. Yeah. Isn't it interesting that often when we, you know, whether we're dating someone or want to get to know someone or in our marriages, uh, part of the date, part of whatever it is, is going out to enjoy a meal together. Right. There's something that brings out the best in us, right. can bring out the best in us, over a meal, which is powerful. I love that. And, yes. I, and I even went a little deeper on that. I asked myself, why is that? Mm -hmm. And I have some thoughts on that too. Give me those thoughts. I think it's because it creates common ground. Yes. It gives you something to relate to. So so if you think about, what, well, the, the date thing, you would assume you have some things you already agree on. But let's say you have religious or political differences or cultural differences with someone when you sit across from a meal with someone, you can disagree on a variety of things. Name anything. But there's this moment of connection that we can agree on when there's great flavors that hit your taste buds. Right. Right? Like, have you ever had that moment? I do. My wife and I do this sometimes. Like, we'll be out to a meal and, and we order something. And like that first bite, you just kind of look at each other and just start giggling. Mm -hmm. Like, because you, you have this instantaneous mutual connection of like, wow, that's really delicious. Right. So who cares what else you disagree with in life? For a moment, you can agree that this thing tastes really, it's really good. good. It's good. Isn't that yeah. cool? So it, it creates cool. common ground. Right. And I think that's why it can break down barriers. Because right. we can disagree on all these other things. But in this moment, can't we agree that, wow, that, that feels good on the taste buds? Right. So now that's provoking a thought in my mind. Go for it. And that is like, we're kind of talking about, you know, going out with people we like and having a meal. And yeah. that's great. Uh, what I have found in... All of my travels, I often have meals with people who are polar opposites, mm -hmm. uh, you know, politically, uh, government wise. Both the one time you feel that you're brought together is over tea and cookies or a meal. Um, and even what would be common enemies from a global point of view, yeah, they can share common experiences over something that touches their taste buds. Exactly. And you enjoy together. Exactly. Which is pretty cool. I love that. Yeah. And and how do we treat our true enemies? Think of prisoners of war, hostages. How do we treat them? Yep. We starve them. That's right. And so that's how we treat our enemies. But how do we treat those that we want to create a common ground with? And just, we have nothing else in common. Can we create common ground around the idea that we can have this cup of tea yep. together? That's right. And Love it does. That. It really does. Yeah. All right. So th that takes us then uh, to dining with strangers, you know, how food brings us together. I love this quote by uh, Cesar Chavez, who says, if you really want to make a friend, mm. go to someone's house and eat with them. The people who give you their food give you their heart. I love that. That's really cool. Yeah. It's not done out of a burden. It's done because of the heart. Mm. And so that's that's a cool, I love that quote. Yeah. They I give you it. their heart. Anyway. I love that. Yeah. Um, there's an Irish proverb that says, laughter is brightest in the place where food is. 
Yes. I like that. Yeah. How many times have we been around a table and just the act of eating and you're having fun, all of a sudden stories come out and you're laughing, you're having a great time and you walk away and you just thought, man, that was so much fun. All right. That's good. And one more, one more quote from Virginia Woolf. I mm-hmm. like this one. One cannot think well, love well, sleep well if one has not dined well. Man, that's so and, true. Yeah, you know, all of those things are the result of of dining, of the food, the nourishment, and the community that takes place. Maybe that's why I'm snarky because I'm starving. Okay, <laughs> maybe you are. Maybe you're hungry. You need a breakfast, John. <laughs> all right, let's let's uh, wrap this up and land this plane. We've like talked it. a lot about food and celebration and the community that comes from it. What are your s- s- thoughts, John? I mean, you've got a lot of thoughts today <laughs> as we we wrap this up. Well, you know, I think you and I, you you share stories about how when you travel, you're often across the table or next to someone at a table with polar opposite yeah. views. But I also just think about our many years of traveling and being at various tables. And my fondest memories are typically food related. Oh, yeah. And not necessarily because the actual dish, although we have had some delicious yes. meals. But it's what happens around the table. Right. And what brings people together, you know, and... I was thinking the other day about there's this restaurant you and I have visited a number of times in uh, Baghdad, Mm -hmm. Iraq, and it's on a boat. So first of all, you walk across this little bridge thing to the boat, and that's cool in and of itself. Like, wow, we're going to eat on this giant boat. It's a huge, like, I don't know, picture a huge barge type of boat, but it's big. And then the delicacy or the the dish to order is, um, I don't know the actual name of it, but like it's a Baghdadi fish. Right. And they say it comes out of the river that the boat's floating on. Yeah. Who knows if that's true or not, but... They they fix it up really fancy and beautiful. It's kind of picture it kind of this fish turned inside out where you right. could kind of pick the insides out of it. Laid it's open. Laid open. Right. Oh my gosh, is it so good? And so we've been at this table with, you know, large group of people. Sometimes there's seven of us and we've been there before. There's there was like fifteen of us right. or twenty of us. And and maybe there's not a ton to talk about in the moment, but when that fish comes out, right. suddenly conversation is oh, alive yeah. yeah, because we're experiencing this fish together right. and it's delicious. It looks cool. We're on this boat together. Anyway, there, anyway, it's just, that's just a cool experience. I do remember that. And it's, it's a cultural thing. It's yeah. not just a dining experience. It's a cultural thing. And they're proud of it to share it with you. You know, one of my favorite memories, um, Goes uh, takes me back to Oman, which is on mm. the end of the Arabian Peninsula, like it's desert. And um, I had some guests who were traveling with me. We were in a uh, a Toyota like Land Cruiser um, going across the desert, and we could already communicate with our driver. Like um, his English, uh, not great. Our Arabic, obviously, not <laughs> nothing. Like. And yet we knew he wanted us to dine with him mm. or I, we knew he wanted us to dine with him. And um, and so he took us back in the middle of the desert, desert to his oasis, you know, where they had dates, a date oasis. And um, we went back there and it was it was a part of their festival or what they were celebrating. And I don't didn't quite understand that because again, we couldn't communicate, but they had um, like taken a, probably a quarter of a cow and um, they had cooked it in the ground with hot Ooh. coals for days. Mm. So now it's slow cooked and it is delicious and it's marinated and other vegetables are with it. And we walk into his home and you sit on the floor when you you ate your meal there. And so they rolled out this plastic um sort of like a blanket plastic, Mm -hmm. and you got together, your shoes are off, you cross your legs, and they bring out all of this food. And we could not, again, communicate. But we we had one of those great moments around a meal where he showed us hospitality, where we enjoyed each other. And and you left really with a sense of like, I think they love us and we love them. Mm. And um, it was something that deeply touched our heart Mm. that he wanted to go out of the way to host us, to feed us. And around that, uh, that meat as we sat there on the floor was just, I don't remember much about that day or that trip, but I remember that meal. Wow. Which is really amazing. So that's it sticks really with cool. you, right? Yeah. yeah. It wasn't the necessarily the conversation. It was the meal. Because you couldn't have a ton of conversation right. because right. of language barriers. But yeah. wow, that's really cool. All right, one last thing. and We'll, we'll land the, the plane here. Yeah. Uh, we've been working on this little project around here. And we wanted to do this book about how Christmas is celebrated around the world. And next month, we'll talk a little bit more about Christmas and celebrations and whatnot. But it applies to this topic because I was reading through the book. 
and I have a little copy of it here. If, if you're watching on YouTube, you can see it. If you're listening, sorry, you can't see it, but I have a little copy of it. And as I was reading it, uh, so we go through every country where we have colleagues around the world, and in er- nearly every story, there's something about food mm. related to how they celebrate the holiday with their friends, right. colleagues, neighbors, students in these countries. It could be uh, decorating cookies. It could be the meal that they do. There was a story about pumpkin bread. I mean, every one of them had food involved in it. That's how central food is to how we experience one another. And I thought that was really, really cool. And by the way, if you want a copy, if you're listening and you want a copy, uh, we'd love to send you one. Can we do that? Okay. All right. Anna, our great producer, said we can do that. So um, go to our, how about we do this? Go to our Instagram, thinkglobal.podcast. Follow us. Send us a DM. Tell us you want the Christmas book. We'll we'll get your information and we'll hook you up. Or go to thinkglobalpodcast.com. Click on the contact button in the top and send us a message and right. we will send you a book. That'd be cool. That's that's really cool. I think, I'll, I mean, I really enjoyed this book. I was reading it this morning over a cup of coffee and I think people are going to really think it's cool to see how Christmas is celebrated in some of the coolest, craziest countries around the world. Right. So I, anyway, but I thought it was neat how food was a part of all those stories. Well, yeah. And, and we're proud of that. That's a very nice looking piece. So I think people will love to get They're going to love it. Yeah. Yeah. All right. So reach out to us. We'd love to send that to you. Hey, listen, as we do end this podcast, uh, obviously there are moments when we eat, when we're alone, but let's begin to look at food differently. I know we've experienced these things, but maybe it's the intentionality of it, of understanding that food not only nourishes the body, but the time around a table nourishes the soul. It does bring laughter. It removes anger. Uh, it builds relationships, and and we delight in it. So, now one of the reasons often some of us bless our food as we begin it is just to show gratefulness to God that we have this to enjoy, not just our taste buds, but those who are around the table. So, when we break bread, we break bread together because it is good for us. And so we uh, we hope that this has just shed a little bit of light on the delight of dining with others. All right, man, this is Think Global, and we look forward to being back with you in December. But on Think Global, the world is our home. Strangers become friends, and friends become family. <laughs>